we're going to talk about entrepreneurship and the startup life um, and some of the challenges and experiences uh, that these fine people have gone through. Um, before I start, I'd love to introduce them first, um, starting with Magnus. So Magnus has started this little company called Kareem. I don't know if you've heard of them. How did you guys get here? Good answer. So they're available in 26 cities across the MENA and Pakistan. Um, they've raised 71.7 million US dollars to date, and they launched in 2013. Uh, Rulla, who's here uh, to my left, left um, is in the fashion business. And uh, you've launched, you, you launched your brand, Rulla Galliini. Did I pronounce that right? Thank you. Feel free to pick up a mic. I heard there's some karaoke going on later on. <laughs> I might skip that one. <laughs> uh, so you launched in 2007 uh, through uh, crowd investment, and, and that's on Eureka, and you raised $112,000 uh, for 16% of the company, and you offered that to 18 shareholders. So you started off as Poupe Couture, and uh, rebranded to Rulla Gallini, and you are available across the Middle East and the world to an extent. Can we I say that? Yep, yeah, recently internationally, in about five to six new stockists internationally. Great, and, and if you're interested in Rulla's line, you can find her at brick and mortar outlets here at the Cartel Al Circal Avenue and Galleries Lafayette as well. Um, and last but not least, Valerie, nice to have you here. So uh, Valerie is an NC graduate and an ex-Googler who started a curated art e-commerce site focused on emerging economies. So um, she has access to over 800 art pieces on her site. And the idea for the site was to give access to art to anybody. And uh, the site is called Collectionaire. Yeah, and uh, we'd love for you to check that out when you get the chance. So, uh, all right. Are you ready for your first question? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's not going to be an interview. I'm just going to be curious. I'm going to, you know, ask you these, you know, a few questions here and there. So, I think, personally, I'm always curious, and I think everybody's curious. So, what state should one be in emotionally, personally, and professionally to want to pursue entrepreneurship, and you can say things like insanity. <laughs> so who wants to go first? Magnus. S so um, first of all, <coughs> really awesome to be here. Thank you for having me, uh, Abraj. Uh, I didn't know they would let in um, a taxi driver to a fancy event like this, so it's amazing. Um, what state of mind do you need to be in to be an entrepreneur? Uh, for me, it was uh, brain dead. Uh, quite literally. Um, I was a management consultant in my previous life, a very happy management consultant, uh, until one day about four years ago when I had a big brain bleeding and almost died. And um, on the back of that, uh, and a long story and a lot of surgeries uh, later, I emerged as Magnus 2.0, the upgraded version. Uh, and with that state of mind, uh, I said, what the heck, I need to... Um, Life is short. Um, I am really good at PowerPoint, but I have to uh, go and do my purpose. So I left without knowing my purpose. Uh, I searched for it for a while, and then I said, I need to go and build something. Um, and it has to be big, and it has to be meaningful. And uh, of all the crazy ideas we looked at, we landed on, uh, on Kareem. Valerie. Thank you very much for having me as well. Um, I would say I don't think there is any rule about when uh, it's the right time to jump on entrepreneurship. Uh, probably if you ask yourself too many questions, you'll never do it. Um, and for me, I was actually having a very comfortable job in a super cool company that's called Google. Um, but I was getting Yeah, cause I mean, that is a misconception because <laughs> people th sometimes think that you're having a terrible life exactly. and you're looking for drastic change, but it can be the exact opposite as well. You could have a terribly comfortable life as well, right? 
Yeah, which is just so dangerous. So basically, I felt like if I stay at Google, I can stay here forever and never try entrepreneurship, which was a dream of mine. Um, so one day I woke up and I was like, okay, I need to find something that I really wanted to. And uh, it was first about spotting the, the concept, the idea, and the industry I wanted to get into. And uh, art is uh, something that has been uh, very close to my heart always. Uh, but I was not from that world at all. So it was quite uh, a big jump and a big decision for me to decide to leave my job and actually build a venture into this. Um, but literally, I really wanted to do something that uh, passionates me and, uh, and that I really feel, you know, that is needed. And uh, the marketplace we built is something that I really needed even for myself to find uh, artworks. And, uh, and I felt there was a big space for that. Rola? Um, I mean, for me, I, sometimes I still can't believe that I am an entrepreneur because I, I never really thought of myself as one. Um, with me, it was more like a kind of organic. It happened quite organically. I mean, I, I come from a design background. I worked a lot on brand building, mostly for, you know, products and brands that didn't really mean anything to me. And I felt after a certain point of time that I didn't want to continue using the skill that I knew the most for products that, you know, I didn't really connect with. So then, you know, I came up with a concept um, of a product or, or a kind of story or, or kind of bigger role that I wanted to play through my career. And I used the tools I knew best to communicate that. So it was more kind of like an organic thing. And, and I, I always like think about this as well. So what, what are the criteria like to consider when deciding what sort of business to pursue? So... Um, <coughs> I'll give you two answers. So uh, when we, when, when we um, I say we, me and my co-founder, Mudasser, he was uh, with me at McKinsey, and he had also reached this point in life when he said, enough is enough, let's go and, 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 and build something. So we were, we were ex-consultants, and you know, we think and live and breathe uh, PowerPoint pages. So for us, the criteria were very well documented. We had a, a matrices of you know, potential size and, and, and impact and reach and ease of implementation and stuff. Um, and we had a short list of about 10, 15 ideas. And most of them, they were in industries that we felt were meaningful. So we felt that anything in education would be meaningful, anything in healthcare would be meaningful, um, even providing food would be meaningful. So one of our, my favorite ideas, I still have the business case if anyone is interested, is to launch a fish farm. It's a fantastic uh, business. The waters in the Gulf are outfished about 80% of the last couple of years. Uh, rising middle class, everyone needs protein, fish, fish is the best source. It's, it's a killer idea. Yeah, if you guys are interested, by the way, it just costs $100,000. <laughs> we accept card, check, cash. <laughs> just meet us after this. I get a commission, Ma Magnus, right? Yes, exactly. My wife said, you're gonna smell like fish. You cannot do it, so we didn't do it. Um, jokes aside, the funny thing is, None of the 10 or 15 ideas we had on that list, we eventually ended up doing. So Karim was not on the list at all. Um, so it just happened that we realized um, that we spent, as consultants, we spent a lot of time traveling. And the one piece of travel that didn't really work well was, was ground transportation. So for us, you know, it, it was very much a, a problem or a need that we had. And we said, you know, this is, you know, a problem is something you can solve. So that's, you know, that's one good criteria. A second thing, is you have to be passionate about it. I'm actually not passionate about cars, but I'm passionate about technology, and there's a lot of technology into a business like Karim. And if you gotta wake up every day and, and uh, spend you know, 18 hours on this six days a week, you, you have to be passionate about it. So find a problem, uh, figure out what you're passionate about, and then do something that is, um, that is local. Uh, there, is, there is so many opportunities, in, particularly in this region, where you don't have to come up with something that is brand new, you just have to do something really well. Yeah. So this would be my, th my three. By the way, Magnus, I'm extremely popular with your drivers because of my mustache. <laughs> they think I'm Pashtun, I'm from Pakistan. Like every time they look at me, they're like, sir, great mustache. <laughs> True story. I've made a lot of friends. Yeah, I mean, I think you could um, be a front face for Lyft in the US. You would have to color it pink, but uh, then you would be good to go. You're, now you're talking about an alliance. <laughs> <Do you laughs> Sorry, we hijacked that conversation. 
we, we, would you like to contribute anything that Magnus missed out on? In what terms of what to consider when, when starting you know, an entrepreneurship journey? Yeah, w what I totally agree on is the portion part and the fact that there has to be a need uh, for, for what you're building. Uh, in, in our case, it was something that we needed personally and we felt that there was no solution uh, to find artworks that is affordable and that is easy to get to. And, uh, but besides that, we really wanted to, uh, you know, un understand how we can change the art world, fun the, the way the art world function. The art world today is extremely intimidating and it's uh, extremely confusing for people who don't know about it. And that's something that we were quite bothered about um, and because it just prevents a lot of people from starting to collect. And that's, that's sad and it, star it, it stops a lot of people from uh, trying to understand uh, art, trying to find new artists and so on. So that's really something that we have we felt needed to be changed. And at the same time as well, I think on the business uh, perspective, we also thought about the industry as an industry that has a lot of opportunities and a lot of potential. Because we're entering in a niche market uh, that not a lot of people are entering into. Um, so for us, it was not that much more about localization, which is the case of Karim, but it was much more about entering a market where not a lot of people have been doing a lot of things and where there is still a lot of room for innovation and a lot of room for new business models to come to come into place. I, I was just going to say it's also it's a very physical experience, you know, industry. You know, people want to see it in person, and you know, and obviously you guys facilitate that as well. But also the value of this artwork, you know, to be able to rent some a piece of art or swap it. Or we're talking about a lot of money, you know. So how do you go about, like, you know, how, how does insurance play into this? And, you know, what sort of down payments do people pay? Or, like, are they all extremely expensive pieces of art? How did you come to, a, to, a, to that point where this is what we're going to create? Yeah. So what... Of course, for those reasons, but for also other reasons, just the fact that everything happens online and that we really wanted to get the art world much more democratic. Uh, we're focusing on artworks only below $5,000 because that's where, uh, that is the entry point. That is where you start collecting and that is where you start being interesting in discovering new artists that are not uh, the big ones that, that are the most well known in the world. Um, so we're focusing in prices that stay quite affordable because if you think of fashion, for example, you reach those levels quite easily as well. Um, and in terms of insurance, transport, and all of that, yes, there is a lot of challenges that comes with it. Uh, but by staying below that barrier of five thousand dollars, we remove a lot of the headache as well. And, and how much of your focus is on regional artists? Um, we have. Uh, we actually started with regional artists. We started uh, the adventure with the Middle East and Africa as like the typical uh, areas and the typical uh, scenes we were going to. Uh, and that's how we proved our business model and we proved that there is interest for, for those type of artists. What we then realized is that the art world is global and uh, online art is a niche. And we had to go beyond the region if we wanted to make something sustainable. Uh, so we started increasing our coverage and we realized that there's a lot of uh, not only countries but also art scenes that have the similar characteristic to the Middle East and Africa. And we started entering into scenes like Latin America, like Eastern Europe and even like small new scenes uh, that are up and coming in Europe and the US that, not, that people don't know a lot about. And that's how we, we grew the coverage slowly. Thank you. And uh, Rola, and on, on the same question, if you want to add anything to what Valerie and Magnus said as well in terms of you know, what are the things to consider when choosing you know, a possible future startup? Um, definitely commitment. I mean, I think um, when you go down a certain entrepreneurial path, you have to be sure that you know, you're doing something that you want to be doing for a long time because it never ha it never comes quickly and never happens easy. So I think you'd have to really be committed to, to what you're trying to create. Um, my journey, my personal journey actually started, it was twofold. It was really a combination between, you know, having this obsession with form and function and their, their relationship with one another and also wanting to portray 
the Arab world or the Middle East in a positive light. I think I, I got to a point where I was just so fed up of, of this part of the world always being positioned in a very negative way. And I felt that I wanted to use the tools that I knew to, in order to portray in a positive light. Um, and that's why I, I began my journey with fashion, because I felt you know, using handbags was that sort of democratic you know, aspect of fashion you know, that transcended cultural barriers and transcended women's shapes and heights and skin colors to tell the story of, of the modern Arab woman and to really show the world what she had to offer. Were, uh, I, I know that you, uh, you got on a top, uh, was it a top 100 list or a top? It was the Vogue's 100 best bags list. Right. And was um, that a tipping point for you? And please feel free to explain what happened exactly. Well, actually, it was about um, three years ago. Um, and then Vogue, every now and then, they do a 100 best bags list. Um, and my brand uh, came up on the number 14 on that list. And the interesting thing about that, or for me kind of like that tipping point, was that it was the only non or emerging brand on that list among all the very big fashion houses. So that's really the point where I felt that my product had global potential. It wasn't just, you know, a local success story, but it really had that potential to, you know, to transcend the regional barriers. So if I were to, yeah, if I were to think of that one tipping point, it would definitely have been that moment where I realized I had to really sort of take it to the next level. So, so, so far we're talking about a lot of happiness and a lot of like smiles and, you know, but I'd love to talk about your first year of operation, you know, once the honeymoon's over. So that first year of operation, what were some of the biggest challenges that you guys faced? Were there that many? By the way, I asked them the same question in the back over there, and they uh, same. They're like, you're quiet. They're like, oh, man. You could probably write a book about just, that. Yeah. You don't really know where to start, to be honest. <laughs> I think that's why you all kind of went quiet. It's just like, what do you, you, know, you start with? Um, I think the biggest challenge, I mean, I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but it never, it never gets easier, and that's what I realized. You always feel like, I don't mean to, to sound negative, but you always feel like you're running to stand still in the sense that there's always more challenges as you grow and more expectations and higher benchmarks. And I think also, you know, you, you personally push yourself so your own, you know, your own objectives grow and your standards increase. So for me, I would never say there was one challenge, but the, but the aspect that there's continuous challenges that you have to tackle one after the other. I mean, it, it is a misconception that, you know, entrepreneurship is all fun and exciting and, you know, you're going to change the world. Because once you actually do it, it's, it's not all fun. It's super hard work. You know, and if, I think if people think that, you know, entrepreneurship is something that they want to do to get away from the corporate world, which is killing them. No, that's not the case. You should not pursue entrepreneurship because of that. It's super tough. You, should, you guys are still quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Magnus's eyes are red. <laughs> so, uh, you, yeah, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Did you want to say something? I think there is so many war stories that, that you know, I would bore the audience until tomorrow morning. But I think um, in the particular case of Karim, uh, what we hadn't thought about uh, at all was that um, people want to have cars 24-7. Uh, even from day one, uh, when we were two guys in a in a small office. So um, if you want to operate a twenty uh, a twenty four seven business when you're two guys in a, in a in an office, that means that you have to either sleep in the office or sleep with the phone, uh, get kicked out of the bedroom because you have people calling t wanting cars, uh, you know, at any point in time, or uh, not sleep at all. Uh, yeah, having to drive ourselves, having to call my wife telling her, she was in the mall once, I'll never forget this, we had a big corporate client in Abu Dhabi, and we had no cars. And I called my wife, she's in the mall, with her old mom and our three-year-old, and I'm like, dump your mom and our daughter in Starbucks and go out to take the Volvo and go pick up this guy. <laughs> he's in Etihad Towers and he's going to the airport, we just need to pick him up. <laughs> so, um, your whole life becomes... Um, becomes what you do, right? Uh, there is absolutely no room for, for anything else. Um, I realized, uh, you know, I realized one day I haven't, hadn't spoken to my brother for six months. So it kind of, it consumes you completely. Uh, and um, I think that's part of the game. But uh, you need to be blessed with, with, with good friends and family that actually understand you because uh, you, you do disappear from, from, from face of the earth for a while. 
I, I still am, I think. <laughs> and you know, and I, I'd love to speak about the um, the investors for a moment, if it's okay. And uh, and I'd love to hear you know your views. So how would you analyze the investor ecosystem in the Middle East, and how would you compare it? to benchmarks around the world. Having a great idea, you know, and putting in your own, you know, sweat equity is part of it. But there comes a point where you need money, you need investment, and sometimes a tremendous amount of it. You know, how would you analyze the ecosystem over here and then compare it, you know, to benchmarks around the world like Singapore or Chile or, or the US? So I think, uh I don't know anything about Chile or Singapore, but I'll, I'll speak about what I know. Um, it is challenging to raise money. Um, when we started, we had put in a little bit of our own savings. And then um, the next step from there was that we had um, you know, some great angel investors who were basically friends and family that we have met while particularly being in the region. So there were a lot of ex-colleagues and similar that could help us get about half a million dollars or so. Um, and you know, that ran out pretty quickly. Uh, and then we needed uh, the next range, which was about one to two million dollars. And that amount is very tricky to raise because you're too small for, for the big boys, but you're a little bit too big for, for um, you know, friends and family and angel investors. So we actually had quite a hard time ra raising our Series A. And then in the end, we uh, got funded by uh, STC Ventures, which is the venture arm of uh, Saudi Telecom. They finally believed in us and, and, and put in a bit more than a million dollars. And from there, it got, I wouldn't say easier, but you get into the next level of, of fundraise where there's other type of players. And, and most recently, last year, when Abraj came on board um, and led a, a much larger round, then you know there's, there's different types of players. I think... Um, the good news is, if I look, we started actually 2012, so about three and a half years ago. Uh, at that point in time, there were very few incubators, very few accelerators. The ecosystem in, in Dubai and in the UE was, was, was much less mature. So I think a lot has happened just over the last three and a half years, which is a great news, because now you can actually incubate in Flat6 Labs or in Astro Labs and start a lot cheaper. For us, it was like, okay, if you want to have an, a business, you need to get an office, and the smallest office we could find was still 80,000 dirhams, which was a lot of money. Yeah, uh, and, and this is for a business model that's proven in other parts of the world, but what about for those business models that are actually disrupting? You know, how easy or difficult was it for you guys, uh, Roland Valerie, to raise funding Rola, we talked about you going the route of crowd investment, but, but in general, I mean, you guys are disrupting, you know, creating a local fashion brand, you know, an online uh, e-commerce site for, for art. How easy or difficult was it for you guys to get yeah. investment? Yeah. For, for us, in our case, it's, uh, it took a lot of time. Uh, I'm not going to lie about this. It, uh, it takes a long time uh, talking to all the investors in the region. What, was, what made things easier on our side is that, yeah, of course, uh, we started with our savings. We started with a uh, little bit of money raised here and there. Uh, we got the support of, uh, of Flat6 Labs in Abu Dhabi as well because uh, we incubated with them. And this helped a lot because uh, it was a great way for us to get introduced to the VC funds in the region. Um, so very quickly, we started to talk to all the VCs. But what is very, very hard is that we were um, pre-revenues at that time. So convincing um, an investor to give you a lot of money because you have a great idea that has to go global and, uh, and that has a lot of potential without much is extremely hard uh, and takes a long time. I would say that abroad, so I'm thinking about Europe, the US, uh, it is a little easier to actually get funding when you have almost nothing uh, built than here. Uh, but we got, uh, we got the chance to meet with a lot of people and convince them. And what really convinced them was the opportunity, the fact that we're entering into a niche market that is booming, and the fact that we had a very strong team behind, uh, both on the tech side, uh, which I'm from, and on the art side, which my co-founder is from. Uh, so we managed to convince them 
them about the opportunity, and that's how they, they jumped on board. So we ended up closing our, our first round recently. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. I, yeah, I mean, I'm, go I'm going through it myself uh, with, with uh, my startup, so I, I feel the pain. But Rilla, wh what do you think? You know, is, is the appetite for risk uh, from investors here in the Middle East much lower than other parts of the world? I think it's definitely changing and over the course of the past two to three years I think there's a significant change and an interest in people investing and I think typically it was either like service or technology uh, projects that investors were keen on, on you know, funding but now recently even to the n not so typical ones, the fashions, the arts, you know, the perception of those kind of industries is changing into you know, ones of being a viable you know, business potential. Um, but I think also when you you know, when you decide to go for funding is, is key. Um, in my case, the, you know, my business had been around for five years, you know, like I had a track record. It wasn't just an idea, but I had something to show for it. And I think that's really what gave investors confidence to invest in a business that they probably didn't know anything about. From my investors, none of them came from a fashion background. None of them came from a luxury background. They came from construction, from technology, different things. But I think because, you know, you showed or you ha kind of have the proof that this can go somewhere, it does give the investors the extra confidence. We, we were t talking earlier that the Middle East was always um, traditionally all about imported brands, you know, and, you know, and now we're seeing a lot of opportunity for regional brands, you know, and for, for brands like yours. But what, are, what is the potential that we're talking about? Because all three of you, you know, are regional. You know, you, you're covering the Middle East, uh, Africa as well, and uh, globally in, in some instances. You know, uh, these are very, very exciting times. And yet, I'm also seeing international brands uh, come here and set up, in Magnus's case with, with Uber, as an example. So, what, you know, what are the opportunities for regional players to come in and, you know, take over these spaces? And what is the edge that they would have? Do you want me to start? <laughs> sure. Looking at me. Um, I mean, again, going back to the case of fashion, I mean, there are billions of, of dirhams spent annually on luxury brands. If just a fraction of that, a fraction, was put into regional brands, it would be huge, you know? What, why uh, is that important? Um, because, you know, c culturally, historically, we have great craftsmen, you know, we have great artisans, we have great resources that are not being put to use, you know? Uh, and this all brings it back to like brands that you can actually export and turn into, you know, uh, something that will drive the economy in countries like Lebanon that's really, you know, suffering. Um, so for me, you know, that's really where the value is. And also because there is a lot of talent, you know, it's not just hypothetical speaking, but there's so much talent that's just being lost because there's no platform, there's no infrastructure to help, you know, to help develop and, and, and grow. Um, and, and in so much of the cases, what we have to offer in terms of local brands is not is not a compromise to the international options. There are so many cases where instead of paying money to an international brand, the local equivalent exists, you know, and by, you know, by supporting that, you're, it's going so much further, you know, and eventually it's going to come back and it's going to help you or your country or your economy. I, I mean, I, I believe that wholeheartedly and it's uh, one of the main reasons why I, I choose Kareem. I do choose Kareem over Uber because it's a local brand. I want to support local brands. And I, I work out at DIFC a lot, and there's a, a place over there called the Gluten-Free Bakery. Uh, I think they're called Sweet Connections. The sweetest lady operates that. So it's a homegrown uh, cafe, restaurant. Everything is gluten-free, local brand. I eat there all the time, you know, whether I feel like gluten-free or not. You know, because I think we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to invest in our people, in our, ro in our, in our local brands. So you have my money. <laughs> How little it may be. <laughs> so, you know, so you, you guys have uh, come a long way. Um, and I, I'm really curious to know, what are the biggest challenges that you guys are facing right now? Or the biggest challenge? I start. <laughs> um, the biggest challenge for us uh, came up quite recently, actually, over the past few months, I would say. And uh, it is the fact that we are a technology company, but we are a technology company in a creative space. And uh, the art world functions in a certain way, whether we want it to be like that or not. 
and uh, you have a lot of emphasis that, that is done by the company on building very strong relationship with art curators. So we work with the art curators and we rely on the art curators to be the one who spots uh, the artist for us. So they are our eyes into uh, the different uh, scenes we tap into. And art curators have, uh, you know, they're very passionate about what they do. Uh, they look for the artist and they have a whole part of their work that is made around physical experience and physical emotions that go together with having an exhibition into a space. And we're telling them, okay, we're going to put that all online and it's going to be, you know, a website and you're going to have images and we will be trying to sell the artworks out of images. So for them, it doesn't mean much. So how do you convince them that this is of value if, you know, for them it doesn't speak to them? So we had to come up with a lot of innovative ideas about how can we reproduce the physical experience that you have in an exhibition online. And this is not easy at all. Uh, so we started to talk to a lot of curators. We started to talk, of course, to tech people to kind of understand and get some ideas. And we came up with very interesting things. So, uh, for example, one of the things we're doing is that we are getting designed by architects 3D spaces, and we tell the curators, okay, pick the walls you want, pick the artworks you want, and we're just going to place them into that image, actually, but we'll allow people to click on the image to buy the artworks instead of just seeing them uh, laid, laid down on, on one page. To create this that experience. Exactly, and so now one of the projects we're working on is that we, for example, putting together a way to host uh, an online exhibition through a hangout on air function so you would be uh, you would have a session together with the curator together with the artist at a certain time to launch an exhibition and you would have everybody coming online and just asking questions and hanging out online but that's that, that was quite uh, quite of a challenge to but do by that. the way virtual reality and augmented reality as well oh my god yeah you guys yeah. are gonna love that yeah exactly that comes into place <laughs> as well Ma magnus how about you so, um, before answering that, I have to answer the previous question or at least comment on it uh, f for a minute because I, I love that topic. Um, I think this region is awesome. Uh, we consider you know, our region to be from, from uh, Morocco in the west to Pakistan in the east. It's about 700 million people. Uh, more than half of them are in cities. Uh, smartphone penetration is about, uh, in many other countries, particularly in the Gulf, as you know, the highest in the world. It's, and there is in almost any sector you look at, services are not there yet, or they're at least not there in the, at, at the level that we, we want them to be. So for me, it's, it's just the opportunity is just absolutely incredibly massive. Um, and and, and you know, that's what we saw. When we, when we realized that for transportation, it's a big space, but in an area where public transportation is not fantastic, um, Let's, yeah, let's leave it there. It's not fantastic. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity to go in and, and, and just build stuff that, that doesn't exist today. So it's not so much that you have to go in and disrupt anything, but you can actually go in and create something that didn't necessarily exist. Um, so the, 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 the need is so big. When we came to Saudi Arabia, we didn't do any marketing. We didn't do anything. We just launched a couple of cars, and before we knew it, we had 80-90% of, of customers being female and, and, and driving around. Needless, you know, fine, there is, there is a reason for that, but now they are actually changing their lives. They can take up a job, they can move around freely because of, of, of a service that, that, you know, we thought was a semi-premium service when we, when we came there. So, you know, I think that there is so many and so big opportunities. The region is massive. It's very underserved in most sectors. And... Um, it is also quite unique in, in, in some areas. So tailoring to those local needs, whatever that might be, and you want to pay with cash because people don't trust credit cards or they don't have credit cards, whatever it might be, that itself opens up so many opportunities. In terms of challenges, uh, the biggest challenge for us right now is how do we keep quality and how do we keep um, the team and values coherent as we are scaling in so many places at the same time? We're still only three and a half years old, but we're in 10 countries, 26 cities. And it's just tricky to get everyone to, to kind of run in the same direction. Um. Rola, how about you? Some of the challenges that you're facing right now at this point in time? 
Um, it's, mo it's mostly in terms of brand expansion um, and more specifically retail space. Uh, retail space is extremely, ex extremely expensive. I mean, it's almost unaffordable for emerging brands. So it's just kind of getting that shelf space, getting access to just being able to test the product and putting it in front of the right people. Um, you know, and most of the big luxury groups in the region, typically, you know, their perception of regional brands is that they're not up to par with the international ones and they just don't even want to take a risk trying them. So I think the biggest challenge is really kind to, you know, ask them to give you a chance, just sort of, you know, open that one door and then, so I think that's, that's essentially the, m the major problem that we're facing. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's a great point you brought up as well. Uh, bootstrapping as a startup in Dubai, what does that even mean? You know, like everything is so expensive. Rent is expensive. Education is expensive. Food is expensive. Like everything I is have ex I have a great example. So I went from being a consultant at McKinsey, living a relatively premium life, to taking the bus between Abu Dhabi and Dubai, because I live in Abu Dhabi and we had our office in Dubai. Taking the bus, it took two hours every day p per way. Yeah, so four hours on the bus. Uh, that, that was us bootstrapping, right? It was, it was really saving every single dirham. We bought our entire office furniture for 800 dirhams from some bankrupt uh, travel company in Bur Dubai or something. <laughs> it was made out of paper. <laughs> so, uh, so, you but know, it's, we, it's we true, did, it's did, true. So, you have to bootstrap because the longer you can last on your own money, the, you know, yeah. the, the better the setup will be once you have to go and seek funding. And there are a lot of things you can do. I learned a lot on, on how you can, you know, um, live on a string. But there are some things that are actually quite expensive still in Dubai. So I mentioned already the office space or getting visas. Some of these things are, they just are what they are. And um, I think with some of the incubators, some of the accelerators, it's getting easier. But um, to attract someone to move to Dubai, to take up a job in an, as, a, as an entrepreneur in a, in a startup, you typically need to pay him or her something. And, and, and you know, in the early days, you, you don't have money for salaries. Either. And, and a lot of time it reflects the, the cost of living of them coming over here to Dubai. Uh, cost of living is one, but you know, if, if we look at it from a, uh, a macro level, so what are, what are the, the bottlenecks you know, that you, know, you, you think that we, we need to start looking at to, to, encourage or to encourage more successful entrepreneurship over here. Cost is one of them. But if you look at like the, the bigger ecosystem, we talk about investment as well. What are those bottlenecks that we need to look at, do you guys think? I would say uh, just making every single step you have to take way easier because uh, what you realize very quickly is that everything is complicated in the end in Dubai. Um, yes, setting up gets easier and easier. It's expensive, but it gets easier. But then after that, like even, you know, just simple things as like opening a bank account, which should take two minutes, never takes two minutes. Uh, it takes about a month, then uh, six months payment system. That was a funny one we faced. Visas. Uh, visas. No, but it's, uh, everything gets complicated. What, what we realized what was one of the first big issues that we faced. So we are Dubai, uh, I mean, an Abu Dhabi based company. And, uh, and we have a local bank account. And believe it or not, if you have a local payment system and you have somebody coming on your side and trying to pay for $3,000, in 60% of the time it was bouncing the payments. So then you're like, okay, what do we do? This is very easy elsewhere, but here you have to go through different tricks, find the right uh, solution to be able to do that. So those little things have to become uh, much easier, I think, with, with time. Okay, I'm getting a, a nod from Fersha saying that we, we should be wrapping it up and um, okay, oh, Q&A. Oh, yeah. so, so We'd love to pass the mic around. If you guys have any questions, we'd love to hear them. Uh, if they're bad questions, we will laugh at you. <laughs> but we're still gonna pass the mic around. So meanwhile, I'd love to ask uh, you guys um, one more question while the mic is being turned around. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, what are the startup terms that you're absolutely sick of saying and hearing? That many? Uh, I'll tell you mine. Inspire. <laughs> Passionate. That's mine as well. 
Disrupt. Disrupt. <laughs> you broke everybody's heart. <laughs> uh, is there a question over there? Sorry. Um, I was going to say thank you very much for this wonderful panel. Um, I've worked a lot in entrepreneurship. I've focused a lot in the region, but I've looked at very underdeveloped areas like Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon. And, um, you know, as Karim, one example, I mean, you've, your market has, goes from Morocco, you said, to Pakistan. Uh, very, very different markets. So I just wanted to see if you guys can kind of talk about how it, what are the challenges working in certain markets as opposed to others um, that you have faced, whether it's with the consumers, whether it's with the regulations, anything like that in terms of starting up your businesses and um, targeting those markets? So thanks for the question. Um, you know, how are the markets different? Uh, you know, I just mentioned I'm super excited about our region. It's from Morocco to Pakistan. At the same time, I have another favorite statement, which is we, there is no, no such thing as the region, right? Uh, and I completely agree. I mean, uh, every country is, is different, quite different. And even cities are different. We operate in cities, right? So Abu Dhabi is very different than Dubai. Riyadh is very different than Jeddah. And, you know, Karachi is very different than Dubai. Um, we believe that the only way we can, we can win and, and, uh, and even operate is to actually it's not about localized, it's about putting a team on the ground that can see the realities on the ground and build from the ground. So without going into all the details, we, you know, we have teams in every city, and not only executional teams like a marketing person or a salesperson, but we actually have what we call a product person, which, is, which has, the role of this person is to figure out how we can make Kareem work in this city. Because it's gonna be very different in Pakistan both in Karachi and Lahore, the main question on people's minds, both captains and customers, is safety. In Egypt, the main question on people's minds is traffic. In Dubai, it's much more about convenience. So, uh, you know, I, I think the answer is you have to take markets one by one. Uh, and uh, for in our case, even cities one by one. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I, I think it, with, with fashion or with luxury was actually quite ironic because you know typically you have certain stereotypes about what people in you know Saudi Arabia like, what people in Jordan like, um, and for me like it was interesting to discover over the past three years that actually there's a little bit more of a universal aesthetic, you know, and the stereotypes are not longer the case. Um, with designing it, it's, it's very important to really kind of study the different cultures, the lifestyles, the aesthetics, and then, you know, always try to be reactive to that, to always tweak the signature or the, or the concept or the story that I want to tell, but appropriate it to their, you know, to their habits. So it was really over time, to be honest, and, you're st and I'm still refining it. So again, there is, there is a little bit of a difference between Dubai and Abu Dhabi, not a huge one, but sometimes it's very small elements that make an instrumental <coughs> difference in the commercial aspect of it. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for a very nice discussion. I uh, just wanted to ask that uh, you guys have been talking about uh, passionate and going all in into entrepreneurship and not looking back. That's the words we've been, been hearing a lot about. Uh, the concept behind all emotional and rationality, where do you define that? Where do you plan to go? Okay, now it's time to go into full-time entrepreneurship because I'm sure that uh, Magnus was someone from the minute you had the idea you didn't decide to quit McKinsey or anything you had that time frame you did the discussions I you quit before <laughs> okay but that's most of great the time, incentive by the way <laughs> you have that part-time entrepreneurship going on for some time before you have that decision to make that yes it's time let's go full-time on it and how to manage that brain versus mind thing going on well, I, I'm personally, I'm with Magnus. I quit my corporate job before going into entrepreneurship. I, I was just so sick of it. And I, I was getting paid well. Um, and I, I had no reason to quit, except I was terribly unhappy with what I was achieving. And uh, I, it took s like six or seven months before I got my first uh, job offer. And I still decided, you know what, I'm gonna go entrepreneurship, you know, so. I didn't plan on it. It just kind of happened. I was just dissatisfied. What about you guys? Um, well, in my, in my case, I started before. 
Sorry. Oh, what do I do? I, I was just walking around. They asked me to come up here and talk to these guys. I was getting a coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> well, she, you know, she doesn't have an office here. Uh, I'm an op entrepreneur as well, um, so I'm a corporate guy. Um, I, uh, I started with uh, the healthcare industry uh, with a company called Philips, sold the first MRI in Yemen, uh, then moved to a company called British American Tobacco, uh, where I launched the new Dunhill cigarettes uh, across the Middle East. Uh, then I moved to Beiersdorf uh, to work with a brand called Nivea, and I um, put together their global strategy for distribution in Duty Free. Uh, then I started this, I thought I'd start the first gourmet shawarma restaurant in the world. No, the universe. And uh, that taught me everything about uh, entrepreneurship, more than I probably would have learned in, the, in, in university. Uh, what happened was that shawarma restaurant became the first social media brand in the region. Uh, it was called Wild Pita, and uh, people from around the world started to contact me and ask me to do stuff like this and, and talk about what is this thing called social media marketing. Uh, that was 2007, uh, 2008, sorry, when it happened, so it was quite early. From then, I went into filming, uh, and I produced uh, a, a travel series uh, that broadcasts to 50 million viewers around the world. Uh, it's called Peter Planet, traveled to 24 countries, uh, did 24 episodes, um, and I'm still doing that. And uh, I'd like to talk about these guys now. <laughs> <laughs> We could talk later. Sorry for cutting in. <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. Uh, now to go back to your question, I, I personally started before quitting. Um, I, uh, I had uh, the idea. Uh, it was not completely mature. I started playing around with it for a little while. And there's just one point where uh, you feel you have no time. And uh, you really feel like, oh my God, if I keep on working until 2 a.m. at night, my boss is just going to fire me the other day because Kit realized that I'm tired and will not understand why. Um, so at that point, I just felt that I, I had to do it. Otherwise, I, I would never know whether it was a viable idea or not. And there's also one thing is that you'll, what you realize very quickly is um, that you'll never get funding and you'll never get people taking you seriously before you actually take that step. So even if it's a hard one to take and even if it's a risky one to take, if you don't do it, your company will stay like, you know, a hobby and, uh, and will never make it to, to the stage of a real startup. Lula? Yeah, I mean, I think you covered it all, but it's also it's also important to be honest with yourself if you're willing to take that lifestyle cut. You know, I mean, I have a lot of friends that hate their corporate jobs and they keep saying, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur, you know, but they live so well, you know, and they're so comfortable and I know that they wouldn't accept anything less of that. And sometimes you do have to make that compromise. So I think it's really a very personal internal um, decision when you make that switch. Any other questions? There's one right there. Hi, good evening. And I would just like to comment about how great it is to see women entrepreneurs. And um, I really like the journey and how Ms. Rula was able to be inspired by different things like Aurela Borales. I saw that one in Cartel last month. My question is as regards the topic of the title, what makes or breaks an entrepreneur? And usually, they have the stereotype that women would not make it into a certain year or a certain um, stage of the entrepreneurship. How did you manage to break that stereotype as a woman entrepreneur? Thank you. Well, I'd like to say. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. Well, actually, because, because it really is a stereotype. You know, at the end of the day, so many stereotypes aren't accurate. And I think there are so many amazing women that are really are breaking that stereotype in, you know, the different industries and aspects of their life. Um, you know, and 
I think culturally in our parts of the world, we're a little bit, as women in general, we're a little bit late to pick up because there are certain societal constraints or cultural expectations that were always kind of like imposed on us. But in fact, I wanted to use that challenge to, to actually challenge that stereotype and to show that, you know what, that stereotype is no longer valid for the Arab woman. She's very modern, she's very capable, she's pus pushing that glass ceiling, and she's doing it all impeccably. Um, so f for me, that's really actually what triggered me to start my whole journey. Um, so, for me, I would say uh, there is definitely a stereotype and you start feeling it when you try to raise money. Uh, that's, that's when it starts to be a bit more complicated. Because uh, when you're playing around with your startup, everybody thinks it's great, but when you start knocking on the doors and, uh, and trying to raise money, you realize that there are not that many women trying to raise money around. Uh, and that's when uh, it, it, it changes. Um, in my case, uh, I think what helped a lot was uh, the fact that we're two co-founders. Uh, I have one guy working with me <laughs> as well. Uh, but there's a whole team behind. And we're a whole team and a whole team made of women, actually, uh, which is great. And, and we've managed to really you know, convince uh, that we understand the industry that we're in, that we have the right knowledge uh, to be able to succeed in what we're doing and, uh, and to make the investors forget about the fact that they're talking to women. And the last questions? Yeah? Thank you. I wonder, at what stage do you decide how big you want the company to be? Because uh, once you start, it's a very personal process, and then, and then you start not being as involved. I'm not saying the quality is compromised, but maybe uh, your quality of life and, uh, and, and not necessarily this equates to, you know, how successful you'd be according of how big your company will be globally. So how do you decide where do you want that to stand into your personal, professional life and how far you want to go? Thank you. So it's a good question. For us, um, me and my co-founder, Modaster, we... Um, as I mentioned, we had come to this point in life where we felt we really wanted to do something different. And the two objectives were to do something meaningful and big. And big, you know, the question is, why do you want to do something big? Is it to um, feed your ego only? Um, and for us, probably yes, a little bit. But also, we wanted to have impact in a big way on a lot of people. And we wanted to build, our vision is to build one of the first true institutions in the region that is from the region. And in, when we say institution, we mean it's a place that actually produces really top-notch, awesome products and services. It's a pl place that actually builds leaders. It's a place that actually cares about the communities in which it operates. And it's a place that will outlive its founders. So for all those things to happen, we had to think really, really big. Um, does it come at the, at the personal cost? Yes, it does. Um, it's a it's a daily uh, it's a daily battle for for me personally. Yeah. Um, in uh, in our case, uh, we actually started uh, saying, okay, we want to build a solution to get more people like art and uh, to give art to more people in in an easier way, and that's how we started everything. Um, then after a while, we realized that. We are tapping into a market that is extremely interesting, that has a lot of opportunities, and we started to get very, very excited about that. So you start putting all your passion, uh, all your personal uh, life on the side, and just like breathing your business uh, every day because you're passionate about it. And, and about how big we want to go is that basically we know that what we're doing is solving an issue for people 
uh, who love art, but we also have a vision that goes way beyond that uh, in the longer term. Because through our platform, we're allowing people to not only buy art, discover art, but we're also allowing them to start borrowing art between each other and uh, exchanging art between each other. So literally, when you think about it, it's like we introducing the fundamentals of the sharing economy into the art world, which is something that is a little bit beyond what has been done and what has been done globally until now. Uh, but at the same time, it's completely changing the way people behave with art. And that's the vision that we have. And if we manage to stick to that vision and really change the way people live with art every day and behave with art every day, we will help like many more artists being seen in many more places and will help many more people having art at home. Uh, so for us, that's really what we want to do. We really want to achieve and change something. Uh, and that's a vision and a passion that we have. Of course, we don't have the pretension to do it from day one. Uh, but that's why we, we're fighting for this. All right. On, on that note, I think we're going to call it an evening. It's been absolutely uh, inspiring to hear you guys. Been, uh, I've been honored to, to be here tonight, to hear your, your passionate responses about this, this very disruptive industries <laughs> that you guys are in. So <laughs> on that note, uh, thank you very much for being here. I think, are you guys going to be around? Maybe if anybody wants to come up to you and ask you any questions. Uh, I've had a great time. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.